Hi, this is Bartosz Miluski with the second installment of C++11 concurrency series. First, I would like to thank everybody for providing valuable feedback, especially on Reddit. I will try to answer some of the questions and provide some more details. The first thing I would like to mention is the use of the Boost Thread library. This is a very good library and it implements most of the C++11 standards, so I, I recommend using it. I'm using just thread library by Anthony Williams because it's uh, a drop-in replacement for C++11. If you're using Boost, you'll have to uh, modify the namespaces a little bit. But other than that, Boost is um, a, a perfect library for this stuff. Here's the plan. I want to start by discussing move semantics. I have two reasons for that. One, one reason is that move semantics is used to implement the so-called unique objects. And unique objects are important in concurrency. And the other reason is that I already used move semantics uh, without mentioning it in the first tutorial. And there was a little bit of confusion about its usage, so I'll go into a little bit more detail this time. Let's start by talking about passing arguments to functions. We can pass arguments to functions by value or by reference. Let me start with the simpler one, passing by value. I have a struct s here and a function that takes s by value. I can create an object of type s and give it a name. And this will create an L value. An L value is something that has a name and has some kind of persistence at least within the current scope. It's not a temporary. So I can call the function f with this L value and a copy will be made for the use by, by the function. But I can also call the function with an R value. I can just call the constructor s right there on the spot and it creates a temporary thing and when I'm calling function f with this temporary uh, this temporary is copied inside the function and the function can operate on this. Now if we are passing arguments by reference things are a little bit more complicated because we can be passing by reference or const reference we can be passing L values or R values and all these combinations produce different results and are used for different purposes. So the simplest pass by L value reference, that's just uh, a regular reference. The interesting thing about this kind of passing is that the function can actually modify its argument. And the caller of this function will see these modifications. So I can call this function f with an L value, and it's OK. But if I try to call the, this function with an R value, with a temporary, the compiler will complain. It's an error to pass an R value to a function that accepts non-const references. Why is that? This is a design decision in C++. The design is based on the assumption that if you are passing something by non-const reference, it means you want to modify it. And if you want to modify the argument, it means that the caller is interested in this modification, right? So it is usually, most likely, an error on the part of the programmer if an R value is passed, if a temporary is passed. A temporary will disappear immediately after the call to the function, so the caller is not able to observe the side effects. It's not able to observe the modifications that were made. And that makes little sense. Now you can also pass by const reference. And a const reference means you don't want to modify the object, so it really doesn't matter. You can pass an L value as well as an R value. But there's this third case. This is new in C++11. It's called an R value reference. So here we have a function f that takes s by 
R value reference, and it's uh, the symbol for it is this double ampersand. That's the R value reference, and its behavior is the opposite of L value reference. So if you try to call it with an L value, it's an error. You can only call it with an R value. And of course, the question immediately is, why would anyone want to do that? Modify an R value, right? I mean, the lifetime of the R value is only for the duration of the call. So if, if the function makes any modifications to its argument, these modifications are lost. They won't be observed by the caller. Except there's one little thing that is done by the caller after the call. And that's the implicit call to the destructor of the argument, of the R value. And this is, this is where the usefulness of R value references comes into play. That you can pass an R value and make a modification to it so that the destructor of the object will behave differently. You will modify the behavior of the destructor of the object. The main reason for introducing R value references in C++ is to be able to implement move semantics. So before I explain move semantics, let me start with value semantics, with values. What does it mean to be a value? It means that every time you pass an object that's a value, you make a copy of it that's passing by value. Now the compiler knows how to make copies of simple objects, the plain old data types, but when it tries to make a copy of a more complex object, an object that has references inside, has pointers inside, it doesn't do a good job. So this is why the programmer has hooks into the object. It can provide a copy constructor and he can provide the overloading of the assignment operator in such a way that, for instance, a deep copy of the object is made. Now, this is uh, something that the compiler will do implicitly. So if you're passing an object which has copy semantics, if you're passing it around, the compiler will automatically call the appropriate method, the copy constructor or the assignment, without you having to do it explicitly. Now, this is good, except that for more complex objects, the copying might be quite expensive. And in particular, in the standard library, you have all these containers, you have vectors, you have trees that have value semantics. And it used to be that copying a vector meant, you know, just copying all the contents of the vector, which can be arbitrary large, and if it's done implicitly, you are incurring a huge overhead without even realizing that. So move semantics comes into play. Move semantics gives you the possibility of not making copies. And this is a, in particularly uh, important when the source of the copy is not used anymore. For instance, when the source is an R value, the R value will disappear anyway. So why making an additional copy of it if the original is disappearing? It's, it's much easier and faster to just you know, switch a few pointers around. So move semantics can be understood as, as an optimization when the source is an R value. Don't make a deep copy just move a few pointers around inside the constructor or the assignment operator. Now the other use for move semantics is in resource management. You have objects that allocate some resources in their constructors and they deallocate these objects or release the resources in their destructors. Now for objects of this type you really don't want to have copy semantics. You don't want to make copies of these. 
is when you have a copy of the object, the destructor of this copy will release the resources and the other one, the, the second copy, will also will now operate on an invalid resource and also will call the destructor for the second time so you will have sort of the double release of the resources which is usually not correct. And the third use for move semantics is in concurrency and this is the unique objects I talked about. The thing is that when you are uh, moving objects by reference, uh, you introduce aliasing. You suddenly have multiple references to the same object. And this is sometimes good, this is sometimes what you want. But in the case of concurrency, that means when you are passing objects between threads, that suddenly you have multiple threads accessing the same object, which is not very good in some situations. So unique objects are the ones that have move semantics and they always belong to only one thread. In order for threads to be useful, they have to communicate. There are various ways of communicating with threads. You can pass arguments to a thread, uh, you can return values from a thread, or there, there's a completely general way of uh, communicating by message passing or by sharing data structures. In this example here, I needed the, the value i to be printed from a thread. And uh, I didn't pass it to the thread function. Instead, I captured it by value from the environment. And this is, um, this is okay, but it's not very general. So let me generalize this and um, separate this function here, the thread function, into a separate function. Okay, so this is a void function. Let's call it thfun. And it takes integer as an argument. Now when I'm creating this thread, I will be passing thread function, thfun. Now how do I pass the integer? Now I cannot do the capture because I'm no longer using a lambda, right? Well, I can just pass the argument, and in fact I can pass several arguments to the constructor of the thread. How this is done is a topic for a separate tutorial. It would be a tutorial about variadic templates. But in any case, if you have a thread function that accepts a bunch of arguments, you can pass these arguments to the constructor of the thread. Now the type checking is done inside the constructor. So if you have a thread function that takes a particular number of types of arguments, they will be checked against the arguments that you passed to the thread constructor. So the compilation will fail if they don't match. So that's pretty safe. Okay, we can run this function. We can compile this and run to make sure that it works. So let me put a breakpoint here and run it, and this is the result. I should mention at this point that there is one more way to make a thread not joinable, and that's by calling the detach method. A detach thread is like a daemon thread, that's what in, in Unix it's called a daemon something that runs without being attached to the main process. Um, the problem with daemon threads, though, is program termination. As I said before, there is no clean way to terminate threads. So if you detach a thread and then your program exits, the threads, the daemon threads, have to be terminated by the runtime. 
And there is no safe way of doing this. Learning concurrency is as much about learning what to do as it is about learning what not to do. And this next topic is fraught with danger. I want to pass the argument to my thread function by reference. Let's see what happens. There are many things that, that are bad here, but let's look first at the constructor of thread. The compiler has no way of figuring out that we want to pass i by reference. Remember, we are not calling the thread function here, we are calling the thread constructor. And the thread constructor is a variadic template. And the types of arguments have to be deduced by just looking what we are passing here. And we are passing an integer, so the constructor will be instantiated for an integer. And that means that the integer will be copied and then when thread function is called, it will be, it will be called with a reference to the copy of i. Now this is not what we would expect normally. But fortunately, if we try to compile it, the compiler says this is an error. It cannot convert parameter from int to int ampersand. Well, this is maybe a little misleading error because normally what's the problem converting int to an ampersand? What, what it really means that it cannot convert an R value of the type int. So how can we remedy this situation? Well, we have to be explicit about it and say we really want to convert this to a reference. And there is a function, std ref, that does just this, converts anything to a reference. And this will compile, and in fact this will run, and you won't see any errors. Hmm. But this program is not correct. I don't know if you've noticed. Why not? But let me let me rewrite it in a way that will expose it a little more. So let me just move this to a separate function. Void test. Okay. And I want to pass the standard vector workers to my test by reference. Okay, so the, the, the work is now split. One function creates the threads, pushes them on the stack, and starts them, right? But it's another function, main, that will wait for them, will join them. It's perfectly legitimate. Now we only have to call this test here with workers. All right. Let's compile this program and run it. Now an interesting thing happens here. See, most of these printouts are sort of look OK, except that, first of all, we see high from worker 2 twice. And then we see these really weird printouts that don't correspond to any of these counters. So what happened here is that after the call to test finished, these local variables, i, they all disappeared. Well, they didn't physically disappear. They were on the stack and uh, the thread functions took references to these variables. Actually, this is one variable. So the thread function took reference to this one variable on the stack, and the, and the function returned. So the stack was then reused, for instance, by the call here, standard C out, to print high from main, and it was overwritten by some new values. And what we are observing here 
these things here are the new values that came from some other function call. And the fact that the number 2 was printed twice, it's because both of these threads, thread functions, took reference to the same variable. And it, they just picked whatever value was there at the moment. This is just one of the many dangers of passing references to threads. The lifetime of the objects that you refer to. In general, there are many more dangers that I'll be talking about in the next installments of this tutorial. So, until next time.